وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فتيمموا سعيدا طيبا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in his glorious book, فَتَيَمَّمُوا سَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا That perform tayammum with high ground, or with pure, pure high ground. So this ayah actually, it's a very simple command, but its background is, is, uh, is very unique. And so what I wanted to do over the next few minutes is talk about the background of this ayah, and talk about some of the lessons that we learned from the background of this ayah. So one time the Prophet ﷺ was traveling with his family. And when he was traveling with his family, um, actually one of the habits of the Prophet ﷺ was that he would take his wives on his journeys. So when he would travel, he would take his, wife, his wives with him. But he usually take one wife with him. And what they would do is they would draw lots and they would take turns. And then the Prophet ﷺ would take that particular wife on the journey. So in this, this, on one particular journey, the Prophet ﷺ was traveling with his companions, and Aisha radiallahu anha was the wife that was on a particular, this particular journey. Now when they were traveling, they stopped at a place, and when they stopped at this place, it was very, very near to the time for the Fajr prayer. So they stopped at this place, and they, uh, st- they were tra- traveled most of the night, they stopped at a particular place, and they stopped there for rest, and when they were ready to get up from that place, Aisha radiallahu anha, she recognized that she had lost her necklace. So she had a necklace. She was wearing the necklace when they stopped initially. When they were ready to get up from there and move forward and continue with their journey, Aisha radiallahu anha, she recognized that her necklace was missing. Now when she recognized that her necklace was missing, then she said, I can't leave without this necklace. And so she went to the Pope Slice on them and she explained that she was missing her necklace and that they can't leave without this necklace and they have to find this necklace. So that began, they began searching. So she began searching, the Pope Slice on them began searching, and in fact the Pope Slice on them commanded his companions to also begin searching. Actually all the companions became very concerned as well because they saw that Aisha radiallahu anha was worried about this necklace. They saw that the Pope Slice on them was also concerned about this necklace. So here all the Sahaba then also began to search for the necklace. Now, when they were all searching for the necklace, it didn't show up immediately. So the whole slice of them actually decided to take some rest while the remaining of the while the remaining companions would search for the necklace. And the whole slice of them uh, was actually lying down on the lap of Aisha radiallahu anha. So she was sitting, he was lying on her lap, and he was actually sleeping like that. So as he was sleeping, then the companions began to start worrying about the fact that the time for Fajr was nearing. Now, it wasn't a big issue that the time for Fajr was nearing, but the real issue was that nobody had water with them. And they needed to make wudu. And because no one had water with them, the Sahaba began complaining that we need to move forward. We need to travel forward because that's where the water is. Nobody carried any water with them because they thought that they would be at a particular place where water was present at this point in the journey. They didn't recognize that this necklace issue was going to happen. So they started complaining to one another until eventually they came and complained to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And they said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that look, look what's going on. Because of this necklace, you know, of your daughter, Aisha radiallahu anha, we've had to hold up the whole caravan. And on top of that, the whole flight tell them is resting. And we're going to need water. And what are we going to do? There's no water here. So they started blaming Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. They didn't specifically blame him directly, but they started raising the issue and he started, they started in a way blaming him. So he became very upset. Now you think about it, I mean, here, on one hand, this is some necklace, right? You think about it, some small thing, some very minuscule thing. It's just a little necklace, and on the other hand is the Fajr prayer of the companions and the Pope sites on them, which obviously was the most important thing in the world to them, their prayer and praying it on time. So also Abu Bakr radiallahu anh became very upset. So he went in and he started giving it to Aisha radiallahu anha. Now when he started giving it to Aisha radiallahu anha, Aisha radiallahu anha actually narrates in the hadith that I couldn't do anything. He was yelling at me and he was poking me. But I couldn't even do anything in response because the Prophet was actually sleeping on my lap. So how could I respond? There was nothing I could do in response. 
So he began blaming me, he began blaming me, and I couldn't say anything until eventually the word came to the Prophet ﷺ that this was a situation. And the Prophet ﷺ, um, also became concerned. And all of a sudden, at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayat. Right? Actually, the ayat are much longer. They describe the, the context of making tayammum. But then these ayat of tayammum were revealed. And so, this, these particular verses actually granted the companions a permission to perform something which no previous ummah had ever been given permission to do. Now, if you look back at the shari'as of the various prophets, many things are similar. They fasted, we fasted, they prayed, we prayed, they gave salaka, we gave salaka, they fought in the path of Allah, we fought in the path of Allah. But tayammum was a, such a special blessing that no community had been given it before. But on this particular occasion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the community with the ayat of tayammum and then subsequently tayammum became permissible. Tayammum means that you take dirt and you make a different type of evolution with that dirt and it, it acts like wudu. Now, when that happened, then the companions, they reversed their situation. At first they were blaming, then they came and they started saying, oh, this isn't the first blessing that we got from the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Meaning, this is just one more blessing that was given to, this was just one more blessing that was given through the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu an to the entire community. Now, what's unique about this particular, well, actually, then you have to finish the story. So as soon as they made wudu and they prayed, then everybody was ready to leave. They got up and the, they all got up and when the camel got up, the necklace was sitting right under the camel. So then they found the necklace as well. So they got the emblem plus the necklace back. Okay. Now, what's unique about this is that when you look at the way the ulama explain this hadith, there's so many beautiful points that arise within this hadith. Okay, first and foremost, is that the Prophet ﷺ used to travel with his family. So a lot of people think that actually the travel of the deen is to leave your family and then go off and you begin to do things without your family, but actually the Prophet ﷺ would take his family with him, in particular his wives. And that's because there is a, there is a sukoon that comes in traveling with the family. And, and, uh, and this is one of the benefits actually, and this is one of the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ. Despite there were some very, very difficult battles, some difficult travels, yet often the, wife, the one of the wives would be taken with. So that's number one. Number two is the background to which the ayah of Tayammum was revealed. So that's the, what I just gave you, the entire history of how the ayah was revealed. Now, if you think about it, it's such a petty thing, right? I mean, a necklace, right? So what's the big deal? Well, it's just a small little necklace. You have to understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching this entire event and uses the loss of a necklace and subsequent looking for it as an excuse to reveal the ayat of Tayammum. So that goes to show you how incredible the Sahaba must have been. Right? In that they were the background for which the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were revealed, in particular this particular ayat of Tayammum. So it goes to show you the status of the Sahaba in the eyes, in the, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now something so petty like a necklace. If, if this happened today, we would also, you know, what are you worried about this necklace? Forget about it. We'll get another necklace. Let's just go ahead and pray. Let's go and get water. Let's make wudu. But this small little instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took this small instance and actually uses it as an excuse to reveal the ayat of the amun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have just revealed the ayat like that. But actually it occurs in this backdrop and that backdrop is the backdrop of the everyday life of the Sahaba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so in tune with the lives of the Sahaba in, this, in, in the sense that it was an interactive, it was a dynamic relationship. Small things would happen in the lives of the Sahaba and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal ayat in response to that. So it goes to show you the status of the Sahaba. Now, as far as the status of the Sahaba is concerned, then the ulama go into a separate discussion as to, well, how can it be Right? Well, what was it about them? Actually, that's the question that you have to ask. Now, so many people have come from the beginning of time until the end of time, right? So what was it about this group of individuals that al allowed them to become people who became the backdrop for revelation? That's the question that they raised. And so, actually, the Sahaba themselves raised it. So the ulama raised it, but the Sahaba themselves actually discussed it prior to the ulama raising the question. And so if you go through hadith, the Sahaba talk about 
the characteristics that resulted in their being blessed with Islam. So they asked the question differently. They would say, we were such, we were such ignorant people. We used to do things that even the worst communities in the world would not do. Yet despite that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blessed us with Islam. This is the way that they would look at the situation. And then they would say, what were the characteristics that allowed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with Islam despite our ignorance? And so, one of the characteristics that they come up with, and you regularly see this characteristic being noted, is their level of commitment. Meaning they were such a community that when they committed to something, they fulfilled it. So if you get them to commit to something, they would definitely fulfill it. Whatever came from their mouth, that's what, where, their life, where their life would be. And that's so why, why when you look at like the Bayah of Aqaba, when the Prophet ﷺ took the Bayah from the people of Medina, when they made this Bayah, they didn't just randomly say, okay, we're making this Bayah, if it works out, it works out, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, if it works out, it's okay, if it doesn't work out, we'll go and do something else. They made a commitment with their lives. And in fact, before they make that Bayah, if you read the story of the Bayah, you'll see that one of the people from Medina says, wait a minute. Do you guys know what you're committing to? Have you realized that when you bring this man over to Medina, you're going to bring the battles, the persecution, the difficulties, all of these things that surround this man in Mecca, you're going to transport all of that into Medina. Are you people ready to make a pledge to defend this man? And then they said, you know, well, what will be in exchange? And then they were, the Prophet said, Jannah. And so they all put their hands in and they made that bayah. But when they made that bayah, it meant something. It wasn't random. It wasn't just, okay, we decided today that we're going to do this, and tomorrow we change our mind and we're going to go do something else, right? It's not fun anymore. So they were people who committed themselves. And regularly, when you look through a hadith, and you see this topic being raised, they, they mention many things. They say, when we spoke, we spoke the truth, right? When we did certain things, uh, when we traded, we traded truthfully. So there were a few things that they were, no, they were noted for, but the main characteristic of the companions was this. That when they said something, they meant it and they committed to it. So even though there would be some, there would be people who would kill their own daughters, when they would say that they are accepting Islam, that was it. They would enter Islam completely and they would act on it completely. And that characteristic was so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He made them the backdrop for the revelation of this being. He made them the, the, the stage upon which the revelation of this being was to occur. And it was an interactive stage. And by that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you the status of the companions. All the, in the previous ummas, you don't have Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu. Right? I mean, the Jews of Medina used to say, if we would have received a revelation like this, we would have been so happy. Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu. Very, very few and far between were times when they were addressed directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous communities. Yet look how many places in the Quran the Sahaba are addressed directly. It shows you that not only was there an interaction between the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the community of believers at that time. And so it behooves us to recognize these characteristics because these are the characteristics that show you what attracts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure towards a group of people. And it's commitment. It's that when you make a pledge to do something that you commit to it, that you stick to it. Now, that seems small, right? So, uh, well, in the time of the Sahaba, it was a big thing because they committed their lives to Islam. And at that time, that was the biggest thing they could offer. But there's so many, we've made that one commitment, okay, and we try our hardest, but there's so many other little commitments that we make. For example, you make the commitment to study Islamic knowledge. Let's just say you make a commitment to a teacher that you're going to start studying so. Once you make that commitment, then you have to fulfill that commitment. Now, no one's asking you to give your life. No one is asking you to give all of your wealth. All that might be happening is your teachers are saying, okay, come on the weekend. Let's say you're in the weekend Sharia course, okay? Come on the weekend. Come from 9 to 11. We're going to spoon feed you. You don't even have to do anything. And that commitment can't even be fulfilled by some people. Then some days are missed because they felt tired. Some days are missed because, oh, I, I really had to go and see my cousin. He just came from out of town. These excuses start arising. When that level of commitment begins to lack, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawajjuh upon that group of people also begins to tone itself down. Not because Allah intended it, but not because Allah directly, um, not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly turns away, but because we turn away. When we turn away, then by nature Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawajjuh also decreases. So it's very, very important that when we decide to do something, first in our Islam, right, we've all committed to Islam, 
that we should be foremost and we should be at the at the nth degree of extreme of, of effort in order to make sure that we commit to what we say we've committed to. And then when we take something else on, we don't leave that thing. Once we decide that we're going to take something on, then we follow it through completely. Now this is one of the characteristics of the Prophet Islam as well. You'll go through hadith and you'll see that the Prophet Islam, when he started an act, any time in his history when he started an act, he always made it a regular habit after that. He always made it a regular habit after that. In fact, there's a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on one occasion was sitting with a group of his companions and then some guests came from out of town. Now, when those guests came from out of town, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sunnah got a little bit delayed. And so he had to place the sunnah in a time when he normally did not place that sunnah. Right? And then after that, he performed that sunnah every single day afterwards. Even though there was an excuse on that one day to push the sunnah up to another time, he subsequently prayed that sunnah at that time every single day afterwards. And it's a whole separate discussion, but it highlights to you that once something existed in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu that became regular. That became a habit. And he committed himself to it. And so for us, I mean, look at these small things, right? Whether it be the weekend sharia course, whether it be our commitment to the sunnah, whether it be a commitment to come here, right, on Friday evenings, whether it be some other commitment that we've made, whatever that commitment we've made, it behooves us to stick to it and to be as regular as possible. Now, fine, I mean, there are times when we can't be, but the point is, is to recognize that this is one of the key means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's barakah descends upon a community. It's commitment. In fact, upon an individual, it's commitment to what we commit to. Right? It sounds so simple. Commitment to what we commit to. We've already committed, so we should just be fulfilling that commitment. So that's very, very important. And that actually is highlighted, uh, it, or that actually is discussed underneath this hadith. Now, the third thing that's brought out in this particular hadith is the fact that this ayah of Damun was actually revealed on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that gathering. Now, everything could have occurred the way it occurred. There could have been commitment of a group of people. The events could have been exactly the way they occurred. Right? Everything the way I described it could have occurred, but if the Prophet was not there, there is no revelation. Right? So it also goes to show you the status of the Prophet that out of all of creation, out of all of creation, in the end, the Prophet still is that interface by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to communicate with this community. And it really goes to show you the elevated state of the Prophet. I mean, a group of people could go, to, we could all travel together, a necklace could be lost, we could spend time looking for that necklace, but there isn't going, there isn't not going to be any wahi about it, right? It's only because the Prophet ﷺ was in the presence of that people, and in the end, because of the Prophet ﷺ, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed those ayat. And that, those ayat weren't revealed upon any other community previously. So the Sahaba acted as a backdrop, but the Prophet ﷺ was the center of that focus. And so, Again, that gives, that's one of the blessings that, that befalls us, is that we're part of that community. We're attached to that interface. The Prophet ﷺ is that interface, and then we're connected to the Prophet ﷺ. And so that chain is still alive. And that's also discussed in the, under this hadith, the, the blessing of being from the community of the Prophet ﷺ. So, what might seem so petty, especially in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just a simple necklace gets lost, and in the end it's sitting under a camel to, to begin with, ends up becoming this incredible opportunity or this incredible scenario under which this ayah is revealed, this huge blessing befalls a community that's never, bef- never fallen upon any other group of righteous people before and it goes to show you the commitment of the, of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That due to their commitment, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took even what was minuscule in their lives and made it the backdrop for this incredible revelation of the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it really, really behooves us to take important lessons from this particular hadith. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who benefit from, uh, from, the, uh, from the acts of the companions and who learn from those things that were present within the companions that resulted in their atta- attracting this tawajjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru ta'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.